Welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news from Taiwan perspective. I'm Betty Chen. In this episode, we will discuss China's new counter espionage law, which took effect on July 1st. What are the areas affected by the law? Also, what additional risks might foreign business face during their operations in China? Are there any constraints imposed on travelers entering or exiting China? What ripple effects could be set in motion by this new legislation? My guests today are Wen Ti Song, Atlantic Council Non-Resident Fellow, and Vincent Zhao, DPP Taipei City Councilor. A warm welcome to both of you on the show. China's new counter-espionage law has expanded the range of actions classified as spy activities. This now includes activities such as associating with spy organizations and their members, illegally providing documents, data, materials or items related to national security and interests, as well as cyber attacks aimed at government institutions, sensitive facilities or critical infrastructure. Currently, it empowers the Chinese Communist Party to conduct inspections of personal belongings and corporate electronic devices without prior notification. So uh, we would like to start with our talk today. And Vincent, in light of this, do you think that China's new anti-spy law constitute any form of human rights violation? Well, to be honest, this wouldn't be the first piece of um, PRC legislation that violates uh, human rights. Uh, but certainly, I think it extends far beyond human rights. I think it is damaging towards China's own economic and national security interests. And let me say why. Uh, the key issue is that China is still reeling from COVID-19. And we've seen uh, a dearth of new investments. We've seen skyrocketing youth uh, unemployment. And I think it's incumbent on the PRC le leadership right now to show that they're taking actions conducive to businesses operating in China. This law achieves the exact opposite effect. What we've seen uh, throughout this law, it, it has fostered the exact opposite of what a good business atmosphere looks like. I mean, businesses thrive when there's clarity and consistency in terms of policy. Now, this law does neither. In fact, it does the opposite. It creates a dampening effect for companies that just wish to do due diligence. Uh, it creates a dampening effect for countries, uh, for companies that are, are assessing whether they should be investing more or less in a Chinese market. And the key reason is this. The provisions of the law are really quite expansive and broad. They include anything related to this concept and idea of national security. Now, for a company doing business here in Taiwan, national security could just very well mean what does China, uh, Taiwan's geopolitical environment look like in a few years? What are some of the actions that the town government are expected to take in terms of addressing these regional and global challenges? You know, how is Taiwan's cross-strait relationship and cross-strait outlook going to look in the future? And this would be a normal part of any multinational doing business in Taiwan. Now in China, many of these due diligence actions could be illegal under this law. And we've seen a number of due diligence organizations already take the heat for it. So I am worried about more than just the human rights aspect. I mean, the human rights aspect is absolutely important, but I'm worried about the ripple effects that implosion in China's economy could cause for the international community. So talking about the ripple effects and also the possible impact on foreign businesses, Wenti, what's your take on that? About this undefined, or you can say that not so clearly defined scope of what um, spy activities are. I think that points to a problem in today's China, really, in their governance model, and that is the, the primacy of national security. Today, in today's China, national security is both paramount and all-encompassing. Uh, if we go back in history, we know that in 2014, that was when uh, Xi Jinping first came out with this new idea called overall national security concept. Ever since then, over the last eight or nine years, they've gradually expanded it so that the latest version includes 20 areas uh, of national security. Falling under the broader umbrella of things like ecological security, natural resource access security, cybersecurity, and what have you. So gradually, really, they are securitizing almost all spheres of public governance, or even private governance, if you will, if you count increasingly, for example, as we see from this new law, for example, that uh, perhaps private or at least semi-public common pi uh, foreign companies or Chinese national may potentially, again, fall under the broad purview of national security, and they could potentially run afoul of law enforcement there. This goes to show, again, a point that Vincent made earlier, which is that a lack of clarity there enables this gradual 
uh, limitless expansion of definition of national security and related causes for uh, running into, uh, into legal problems. And that, again, leads people to become a lot more careful. It's, it may potentially also lead to some kind of chilling effect, if you will, in terms of the space people have for voicing their opinion in public or even private uh, spheres of life. So talking about this kind of lack of clarity and also the possible uh, chilling effect, back to you, Vincent. This new law allows CCP to conduct certain inspections and they can do things to, say, personal uh, possessions or they can empower internet service providers to monitor the private company's communication. What's your take on this? So I was reading um, this, um, this article written by this person called Peter Humphrey, and Peter Humphrey was a former Reuters correspondent, had worked as the head of a due diligence firm in China for a number of years until he was convicted under China's past iteration of the counter espionage law. And he ended up being in prison for two years. And it was really, if you read his account, and it was really preposterous. I mean, they, uh, they, they confiscated his laptop. They ran through, they, they basically, you know, ran through his laptop with, with a fine comb to find any segments, any documents that could potentially be linked. And they were linking um, issues that were, you know, publicly accessible as evidence of his espionage activities. Uh, but that's the precise point when you really don't have a very well adequate rule of law system in China is that these expansive powers that are granted uh, to the, pub the Public Affairs Bureau and to other uh, legal mechanisms in China could be used to t detain and to search and investigate a whole series of people and actions and organizations without any oversight. Um, and so, you know, in this example that I was referring to earlier, Peter Humphrey said that under this new law, he could have been convicted for over 20 years um, under this new law. So the point, again, is I don't think it's necessarily to look at any specific aspect of the law because, I mean, the CCP is well versed in this idea of legal warfare. Anyways, they're quite used to this idea of having a legal mechanism to justify whatever political aims that they have, but really to look at this law in the overall context of what uh, Winti was saying in terms of really the primacy of national security over this idea of free trade and economics that we see in today's China. You talk about a very important point, that is the lack of oversight. So now, Wenti, uh, my question for you. Cyber attacks on government institutions or critical infrastructure will now be considered espionage. So what does this tell us about the CCP's views on national security? Yeah, again, it's all about how its national security today has become such a all-encompassing concept in China's governance today that it covers so many areas of their public life today. And that's a problem because, again, uh, for, a, for a polity like China to function well, they need to have some effective means of having a feedback loop. When you run a policy, you need to get opinion from people on the front lines, both the local level officials administrating those policies, as well as the people who are suffering from or potentially benefiting from uh, those policies. That's how you get a feedback loop going on. That's how you can know whether a policy works, and if not, how to fix it, how to make it better. At this point, however, when uh, normal daily speech can potentially be construed as a legal offense, it's going to make it a lot harder for them to get the kind of feedback they need in order to early detect problems in the governance as well as early attempts to fix them and uh, improve the governance in general. You talk about very important idea, the feedback loop, that is to get the feedback, say, from the other government officials or even the public. But does the implementation of this new anti-spy law eliminate any place or space for discussions or criticism on the government's policy? Vincent. Well, I mean, to a certain, exist, to a certain extent, that did not exist anyways, even prior to the counter-espionage <laughs> law. Uh, I'm not sure there were effective mechanisms for, for example, raising problems with the prior uh, counter-espionage law. But certainly that space has further tightened in today's political atmosphere in China. Now, my problem with all of this is this, is it's not necessarily, again, the law itself, but it's really what the law implies. And the law, so, so let me give an example of this. Arbitrary detention, that took place before the law. I mean, it took place before the revision of the law. It took place before the counter-espionage law was uh, introduced eight years ago. I mean, it's been going on for a long time. Warrantless search of devices, I mean, Every State Department employee, every diplomatic employee knows that you carry a burner phone into China. You've done that for ages, simply because of the fact that your phone can be confiscated and shifted through at any single point. So all of these measures had existed prior to that. But what we're seeing is that instead of having a better legal mechanism in place, instead of providing more clarity in terms of how these 
investigations would be uh, conducted, you're actually moving in opposite direction. You're giving more unclarity. You're giving more expansive powers. You're saying that it's actually okay to do more to invade personal privacy and to justify the warrantless search of devices. So, you know, again, this is China, the PRC, in many respects, moving backward rather than forward. And this policy, this new law, is just further proof of that. So, Wenti, under this revised new anti-spy law, so individuals could face travel restrictions when they're traveling to and from China. Do you think that this will dampen the enthusiasm of global tourists wanting to go to China? I think for a while, I think the U.S. State Department has already issued a travel advisory telling Americans to uh, really rethink it and be as prepared, as ready as they can before they think about traveling to China. So we've certainly seen signs of that going on already. And I think that for the average foreign potential tourists who are thinking about where to travel for their next relaxing holiday, potentially even family holiday, bring uh, elders or children with you. If you had additional legal hurdle, if you had additional ambiguous legal hurdles, that, uh, that, that's going to tell you, hey, if you say one thing wrong, if you do one thing wrong, that's going to potentially get you in trouble. And perhaps they'll be thinking about maybe there are other destinations that are equally as interesting, but perhaps potentially a lot less burdensome. So I think definitely this new law, through its very scope, through its very ambiguity, again, is not going to be an asset uh, for China's tourism to put it lightly. You, p you talk about the U.S. advisory for their travelers and actually Taiwan's Mainland Affairs Council issued similar warning telling the people of Taiwan, if you're traveling to spy, be careful, you might be branded as a spy. What's your take on that? Well, to be honest, that travel advisory should have probably been issued years ago. Um, I mean, we've seen a number of arbitrary uh, detentions of Taiwanese citizens traveling in China. You know, I've, I, I know a few people um, quite well in terms of those that were um, detained in China and, and now you know um, some of them have been released and are speaking about their experiences uh, here in Taiwan. I think the key point is this is that um, is that that space for people uh, that have different opinions on cross trade that may be affiliated closer with the DPP or other for example political parties here in Taiwan and to travel freely to China I mean that had that space had ended years ago to be honest and and I mean I tell colleagues all the time even colleagues that that you know worked for me in a city council perspective that you know you should really think twice before you go to China anyways because you simply don't know you simply don't know and and they justify their actions through legal means I mean they justify their actions through political means there is always justification for why you have to be detained why you have to be jailed and why you have to be investigated and so the best thing you can do is just remove yourself entirely from that equation and you can never give that opportunity for them to have to find that justification so you know, I, I think that's a warning that's increasingly repeated in many places around the world. One of the people I had met um, a few months ago was uh, Michael Kovrig, who was one of the Canadians detained in China as well for quite a long time. And that was his point as well. It's just that, you know, he was detained for a political bargaining chip. There was absolutely nothing that he did wrong. And, and, and there was nothing that they could prove. And, and that was concrete in terms of him violating uh, some law or another. But, but he was still detained. He was still detained. And he was detained for the very reason that they wanted to force the Canadians uh, to the table in terms mm -hmm. of discussing a, a release for the Huawei, um, one of the Huawei mm -hmm. executives. Um, so again, this is an effect we're seeing increasing around the world. I think we're going to see gr more international countries pay attention to the fact that their citizens could be detained at any time in China. Definitely, we will talk more about the revised anti-spy law in a bit. Looking at the Chinese economy, it is evident that the current state is characterized by substantial pressure and challenges this year. Since October of last year, China has been observing a continuous slowdown in its export volume, although there was a surge in exports following the relaxation of pandemic restrictions and a Chinese New Year, with a growth rate of 14.8% in March and 8.5% in April compared to the corresponding period in the previous year. May witnessed an abrupt decline of minus 7.5%. Considering the current state of China's economy and the timing of a revised counter espionage law, some are asking if there's a link. Jason Shu, senior fellow of Harvard Kennedy School, spoke earlier to Carmen Lucero, fellow of Yale Law School, about China's counter espionage law amid downward economic trend. Let's have a look. If we look at the current situation in China from the economic level, we can find that the Chinese economy seems to be in a severe form of high pressure this year. We have seen that since 
October this year, China's export volume has continued to decline. It began to increase sharply. In March, exports increased by 14.8% year to year. In April, exports increased by 8.5% year to year. And in May, they suddenly dropped to minus 7.5%. Overall, the curve is going down. Carmen, what is your, your view on uh, China's uh, GDP? The, the expectation was 5%, but the last uh, quarter's GDP was only recorded 4.5%. Does this mean that Chinese economy is facing as uh, severe challenges due to the competition between US and China? So it does seem clear that the Chinese economy is facing a number of headwinds. Um, it didn't meet sort of expectations of a post-pandemic boom, um, even a temporary one. Um, so it does seem clear that they're, that they're facing economic uh, challenges ahead. Now, while I am not an economist by training, my understanding is that uh, the cause and effect, I think, might be reversed in this case, where the economic problems, um, I think, might be causing some of the competition. And then now, as the competition gets worse, um, we could see sort of a feedback loop going forward to where the competition has negative impacts on, on the economy and then the economy continues to get worse and spurs further competition. But I, I think that's the case for both from both the U.S. perspective and the Chinese perspective. The, they're both facing domestic economic uh, challenges and are trying to, in part, respond to those domestic economic challenges um, with policies that are perceived by the other country as a form of competition. Why does China want to introduce a new version of anti-espionage law at this time? Will this tighter monetary methods deter foreign investments or Taiwanese businessmen? What's your view, uh, Carmen, on this? So I think that's a very good question. And while I obviously um, cannot read the minds of the senior leadership, um, my understanding is that this is a part of sort of a broader push to just enhance national security and particularly national security in the digital age. Um, so we've seen over the past couple of years sort of a greater push focused on security and particularly data security with formal re re legislation and regulations, but also the implementation of, of existing laws have made it much more difficult for industries that are engaged in transnational commerce and that use data, which is a lot of industries, uh, are facing just challenges in this sort of new security environment. My understanding is that this is less about sort of the most immediate economic data that we've seen, say from this year, and that the, this sort of push towards greater security predates um, sort of current understandings of the economy and is sort of a part of a broader political push. That being said, it does seem clear that it is having real negative economic impacts and is, I, I can say, deterring, say, American companies from in investing in or expanding in China and is certainly raising the level of risk um, and caution when it comes to how I think American industries are thinking about business in China. When it comes to Taiwanese businesses and individuals and their thoughts about um, and their thoughts about investing in China or sort of cross-strait business relations, I have to imagine that they're also thinking in terms of heightened risk um, compared to before. What is Xi Jinping's intention of comprehensively protecting national security? and preventing any sensitive information from flowing to foreign governments and investors. How conflicted is this with the economic growth? This, this turn towards security um, is sort of a long-term project that started a couple of years ago. And we're seeing just continued iterations of that. And big data, quote unquote, or sort of the, the increasingly digitized economy um, in which data plays a key part, I think, presents unique opportunities, but from a security perspective, presents uh, unique challenges, both in the sense that data is very difficult to, to define. When we talk about data, we're talking about many, many different things. And simultaneously, that sort of breadth of what data can mean from a security perspective means that there's a lot of unknown risk. There's some known risk, of course, but then there's a lot of unknown risk. 
Uh, and so particularly in this environment of low political trust between, say, China and the United States, I think the Chinese leadership's reaction is to tighten and, and, to, and to be more cautious and to, yes, and to, and to be more risk averse when it comes to how, when it comes to cross-border data flows. And while I think in, in their ideal world, this would not have economic costs, it seems to certainly be having economic costs, it's both for Chinese companies trying to operate internationally, as well as for companies outside of China in the United States, in Europe and other countries, as they're thinking about investing in China or doing business in China. Wen Ti, some Taiwanese business people operating in China already faced, say, travel restrictions or they are under some investigations primarily, primarily related to taxation issues. But now we have the new law in place and they could be branded as spies. What kind of pressure would this create? Financially, this is going to mean more higher cost of doing business in China for them. Uh, if they had to hire due diligence company before, if they need to hire people with connection that can endure to government official in China before to hopefully sidestep some of the legal uh, challenges, hurdles here and there, uh, reasonable and unreasonable ones, of course. Uh, now they may be running into even more confusion about whether it's even safe for them to hire due diligence people or people who are who have connections. So because that could be seen as a way of uh, of having doing espionage as well. So I think for them on a personal level, on the business level, that's going to be more cost of doing business and more fear uncertainty. And this again goes to a problem of ambiguity because ambiguity means flexibility for the law enforcement and officials responsible for running this uh, this regulation law enforcement, but. Flexibility also means, however, that you are at the mercy uh, of those very officials because they get to define what counts and what doesn't count as a legal infringement for them. This is for them personally. I think for broader speaking, politically speaking, I think this may create an unfortunate effect in terms of cross-strait relations because these Taiwanese people, uh, Taiwanese business people who are doing business in China, they are almost like the, the natural bridge builder, if you will, between the two sides of Taiwan Strait. They naturally are dual stakeholders who f with professional and personal links on both sides. They have experience, probably some knowledge about how things work on both sides as well. But with this new espionage, espionage law in place, it's going to become a lot more uh, precarious in terms of how they're going to go about carrying themselves in public. Because if you want to be seen as an honest broker, you probably want to come across as empathetic. You want to be able to show that you know the perspective and concern of one side and the other side as well. But these days, if you do that in public, though, you may potentially be at risk of being labeling as a, let's say, either foreign agent or as somebody who is too sympathetic towards the other side, otherwise beholden to interest from the other side. And therefore, that's going to mean that with the chilling effect we talked about earlier in terms of how free they feel about uh, sharing the ideas in public, these natural honest brokers, these natural bridge beauty between the two sides are going to be likely a lot less effective and a lot less uh, open to playing that role publicly going forward. So you just talk about the possible impact on the so-called bridge builders across the Taiwan Strait. Vincent, what do you think of the new law? What kind of impact might this have on the overall cross-strait relations? Well, I think it signals what we already know, which is that Xi Jinping uh, prizes national security above all else. Um, initially, I would say this, there was a lot of speculation, um, particularly after China lifted its pandemic controls, that Xi Jinping would unveil a series of business-friendly legis legislation and uh, ways to spur new investments and trade and so forth. And, you know, to be fair, I think we've seen perhaps the opposite in that respect. So I, I would say, you know, the signal goes far beyond the law itself. It's a very, very powerful message. It's a powerful signal that despite the challenges China faces, despite the economic instability in some respects, despite the social instability, there's no backing down. There's no second guessing. Xi Jinping is going to go down this road because in a sense, he has his eyes on a big prize, which is the consoli con continued consolidation of power within the CCP. Now that by itself, all of this taken together, has enormous implications for the cross-strait relationship because we have to, number one, understand the sort of person that Xi Jinping is. I mean, knowing his motivations, knowing his determination, knowing the steps that he'll take to 
um, focus on prioritized issues he cares about all, any, above anything else. I think that's an informative um, measure for Taiwan as we think about cross-strait policy. But also more than that, as when he said, people-to-people -people relations are an enormous part of the cross-strait relationship. Um, the governing party, the DPP, the KMT, I don't think there's any political party that's going to be able to say that, you know, that these sort of exchanges are bad. No, these exchanges, I think, are good for both sides. But what this will do is further show that there's going to be risk to these e exchanges and there's going to be costs that will have to be borne out. And that has a dampening effect. So, you know, taken overall in the cross-rate relationship, I don't see how this has the potential to be, you know, a positive signal. Uh, certainly, I think there's going to be political security uh, economic as well as people-to-people -people implications both now and further down the road. Talking about the possible risks, uh, so Wendy, you just talk about the important roles played by these bridge builders across the Taiwan Strait, meaning the Taiwanese business people operating in China. Do you think that the new laws in place will deter them from having further investment in China, but rather they would like to diversify their investment or moving to somewhere else? I think naturally when they see increasing political risk of doing business, one natural response then is to diversify and try to pool your risks in a sense. So you put your eggs in more than one basket. Mm -hmm. So with, it, with this new increase of political risk, political risk, naturally they are going to be looking at places like Vietnam, places like uh, Southeast Asia, India, and farther shore as a way to diversify the investments, as a way to ensure against potential political challenges that they may counter, uh, encounter in China. So back to you, Vincent. Some people are saying that China's economy is going down recently. So actually, the bad economy is a way to prevent China from really implementing the law. I mean, maybe this is more like a facade, but because the bad economy, China actually still needs the business staying in China. What's your view on this? Uh, I don't think ultimately it matters whether they implement it or not. I think the dampening message, the, mess, the political message is already out there. Um, it's actually quite interesting because I think this pandemic has shown that the high growth rates of the Chinese economy have come to an end. Now, this, the, the, the CCP has been characterized, its leadership has been characterized by this high amount of growth that we've seen all the way from Deng Xiaoping all the way to the first and second terms of Xi Jinping. Now, that has now ended. I think it's, it's, it's outside the bounds of any economist to imagine that we're going to reach again 7, 8, 9 percent, even double digit growth in China going forward. Now, that brings harbors problems down the road. I mean, China's demographics are a huge issue. I mean, they're going to be the first country to really get old before they get rich. Um, their birth rate is about on par as Taiwan right now, and we're suffering a demographic crisis. That will be exasperated on the scale of multitudes. Um, in China. So that's the first issue that we're on a watch out for. The second issue is really um, economic instability leading to social instability. Now for us that creates risk and challenges because we are easily a scapegoat for those domestic instability difficulties. And so for example when the CCP in the past has chosen to detract away from domestic problems. They focused on bringing further pressure, not only against Taiwan, but uh, also against other international partners as well. So, you know, all of this will lead to problems down the road. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, that China's economy will not grow again. I'm not, I'm not saying that growth is over. I'm just saying that what we've seen in the past is certainly over. And again, I think this law and the at other actions that Xi Jinping has taken in the run up to this show that they're prepared for this. Mm -hmm that they're prepared for it, that, that they're not going to pursue growth at all costs because in a sense they know that that high growth period is over. And so their priority right now is to, is to ensure national security despite an extended period of maybe less than stellar growth rates. And so that should be something, again, the international community should be clear-eyed about. So you just said about that the national security for now has become the top priority for the Xi administration. So what is the rationale behind China's expansion of the scope of, uh, scope of the anti-spy law at this time, Wen I think naturally this, again, is about power centralization for Xi Jinping era China. You see this in the passing of this espionage law, of course, which greatly expand the power of the public security and national security apparatus. We see this also uh, in other kind of legislations as well. For example, on the June 28th, China also passed a new foreign relations law in which they named uh, the party center as the first and foremost body responsible for making all decisions pertaining to foreign relations. That's the party, uh, not the state council, i.e. a cabinet, not the, uh, the legislature, the party. 
uh, you also see this again uh, a couple of days later, really, on June 30th, when China released a new study guide, study guide on CMC, Central Military Commission Chairman Centrality. And they issue and distribute this guide to all PLA soldiers. This guide basically says that Chairman Xi alone has all power making uh, power, uh, all decision making power on all things pertaining to military policy and security policy. So you see this intelligence and national security, espionage, you see this in foreign relations, then you see it now in military policy as well. All this combined together to drive home a message, and that message is that the party center today, especially Xi Jinping core, is in the driver's seat of anything happening in China. Talking about being on the driver's seat, so Vincent, do you think that the reason why at this moment, the enactment of this revised law. Perhaps is it because of the insecurity of Xi Jinping trying to make sure that he has control over everything? I'm not sure, because I think that over the, what we've seen, certainly in his run up to the third term, but also preceding it uh, and following it, is that Xi Jinping is very much in power and that all signs of dissent have been quashed and removed, sometimes forcibly, like Hu Jintao, uh, <laughs> if that was a sign of dissent. But, um, but the key of the matter is that I think uh, Xi Jinping is in a secure position. I think he's the uh, most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. Um, and I think he knows that. And I think his cadre of supporters and followers know that as well. So I, I'm not sure that this needs to be done in respect to ensuring that his power is cemented even further. I, I think it's more of an outward signaling measure rather than inward power signaling measure. I think it's intended to signal outwards within China, but also international community, number one, that nothing takes a backseat to national security, nothing. The economy, investment, trade, nothing takes a backseat. Number two, China is serious about waging its definition of legal warfare against its opponents. I mean, this is the very idea of legal warfare. It's using the law to justify what is supposed to be unjustifiable, um, but China's pursued that. But also, number three, it's to show the international community that China is not going to back down from this challenge that they face in respect to not only the United States, but also other democracies. And it's not intended to back, it's not going to back down despite whatever challenges Russia may face. It's going to double down uh, in terms of its claims to power. So I think, again, that it's a signaling measure and it's a quite a powerful signaling measure. And I think it's very, uh, it's one that will very much have implications both inside and outside China for years to come. You just talked about it may uh, not just be a signal, and we already have seen some actions. For example, multinational corporations in China, such as Bain and Company or Men's Group and Capvision, have undergone some certain inspections. And even uh, China has accused Capvision of illegally obtaining sensitive information. Do you think that this kind of new legislation does raise threat to foreign companies in China, Wenti? Uh, before I get to that, I kind of want to jump into a point that Mr. Vey Mason made earlier as well, and that is about uh, the role of security in today's China. We saw at the 20th Party Congress in October 2022, uh, they, uh, they incorporated into the party charter this new phrase, right? Going forward, they're going to find better balance, they're going to optimize the balance between economic development and national security. Now, that sounds like a very innocuous phrase, if you will, like who doesn't need to balance between economic development and national security? But then again, this is China, so we need to look at the context that we're working with. What are the priors? The prior is that ever since 1987, that is the 13th Party Congress, they enter this phrase into the party charter. The party, that phrase is that going forward, there'll be one center around which all CCP's work and policy revolve around. And that center is that the center is economic construction. And around, those, around that center, all other works, the the two fundamentals, i.e. CCP's continual leadership, as well as the continued dominant of Marxist Nenlin's ideology, will follow. And everything else then follow that. So if you look at that baseline we're working with 1987, economic construction was the center around which everything else revolves, then the very seemingly innocuous shift from that to we need to balance between economic development and national security tells you which way things are trending, namely toward more and more national security, arguably uh, even at expense of some level of economic development 
And if we see China's economic growth rate slowing down ever so slightly in recent years, perhaps there are good black and white evidence and reasons right there if you look at 20 party Congress statements. And they have their own way of, say, whatever, rebalancing their priorities. But at the end of the day, it's all about national security for them. Well, it's quite Orwellian, right? It normally means the opposite. And <laughs> so when they say they're promoting stability, what they mean is that, well, they're going to crack down on any signs of dissent um, from you. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do think one area that we have to um, really um, talk about is the idea is, is the idea of this effect on businesses because I, we explored this in the beginning and I think it's worth stating because it's a political action but the effect I think will be more most pronounced among businesses so I have a lot of friends that work on due diligence in China every single Fortune 500 company every single large enterprise talking about investments or doing business in China has to do something called due diligence right they have to look at market factors geopolitical stability they have to look at in terms of how they see um, not only their own economic outlook but the political outlook for years to come. And you can't really engage in effective due diligence without talking to people. And very so often that includes government officials. So this is the same in the United States, right? So if you know um, we're talking about a major company, even one such as TSMC, that is thinking about going into Arizona as they have, they're gonna engage in due diligence, not only in terms of Arizona itself, but also in terms of the federal government. And they're gonna do a lot of outreach. Now under this new Chinese counter espionage law, all of that could be potentially illegal. And so then how do you do due diligence? Well, there's only one thing left, right? Which is you take whatever the party says for granted 100% because there's no way you can credibly assess whether that's true or not. And maybe that's an effect the CCP wants, but I'm not sure that this is something foreign businesses are gonna accept, particularly when it comes to millions, if not billions of dollars. And so what we've seen so far, for example, are the uh, companies that have come under investigation under um, this counter espionage, including the, um, the example I talked about earlier in terms of Peter Humphrey, all of these companies have been engaged in due diligence. And so it becomes a very, very murky line, this idea of just wanting to get the best information for clients and, and, and crossing that into what the Chinese believe is espionage and spying and undue influence towards government, um, government officials. And so I'm just not sure how that's gonna work out to be honest, I don't see that working out well uh, for the CCP and for foreign businesses in particular. Definitely, we will talk more about that aspect later. In the past, China has pursued an aggressive diplomatic approach known as the Wolf Warrior Diplomacy, generating much international debate. Recently, China's top legislature enacted its first foreign relations law set to take effect on July 1st. The law grants China the authority to employ necessary countermeasures against activities that jeopardize its sovereignty, security and development interests. China portrays this as a response against Western hegemony. Wendy, you just talked about the foreign relations law. What's the significance of this new piece of law? So I think there's a common way to read it and there's a less common way to read the significance. The common way to read it is that this is all about countermeasures, that this law gives the president, Xi Jinping, uh, great power to impose counter sanctions against other foreign countries that may be imposing sanctions on China economically, diplomatically, and what have you. That's one way to read it, and you can also argue, of course, based on this point, that uh, this is also a way to uh, perhaps signal. It's a kind of preemptive deterrence, if you will. By having this law in play, it's a way to show other countries that, yeah, we're getting serious about this. So if you still sanction China, then something may be coming uh, to you as well from our end. So I think that's a common way to read it about sanction management. The other way to read it, however, is much more domestic Chinese politics in focus. And that is, if you read uh, the actual law's text itself, it lists five national level organs that are responsible for uh, running China's foreign relations. The five are Central Ministry Commission, the legislature, the cabinet, state council, and uh, there's one more which from memory that doesn't come to my right at this second. Uh, but the other one though, the, the last one is the CCP party central leadership. The interesting thing is that of these five, four of them, when the law described their power, they had this line that applied to them. That line is, these bodies will apply, they will exert power over foreign relations uh, in accordance to the power that the constitution and relevant legislations have granted them. 
that line does not appear in the paragraph that talks about the power of CCP party center uh, and their power over foreign relations. You can almost argue that this is a way of signaling to everyone else that the party alone, its power just, it just is. It does not require a legal foundation to exercise the power, nor is it constrained by having or not having a legal foundation when it comes to exercising power. So again, if you look at this in much more domestic Chinese politics term, this is again about showing that the party is in the driver's seat, not the government, not the legislature, not the military. So talking about the immense power from the party. Now, Vincent, I wonder, could this new war between the US and China intensified due to the law? In many respects, it already it codifies what the Chinese already do many times, oftentimes in terms of their foreign policy. So this whole idea of war, war forward diplomacy is really um, grievance-based diplomacy. It's an idea that that we're going to take preemptive actions against those that we deem as potentially harmful for our national interests. And so uh, this law just codifies what Chinese diplomats are essentially doing every day. And so you, one could argue that this further gives credence and it further gives legitimacy to this whole idea of wolf, wolf warrior diplomacy. Because previously there was a debate on you know, whether these wolf warriors are individually or you know, were, were they sanctioned uh, or, or, or they officially you know, sanctioned and supported or were they kind of acting individually and maybe in slight violation of China's diplomatic norms. No, this law signals quite clearly that this is in accordance <laughs> with Chinese law. So that's, that's, I think, the first component. And so the second component, um, again, I think Wen Ti said it best when he said preemptive diplomacy. And very much this law is preemptive diplomacy. And we have to understand that Chinese foreign policy is really based on, the, on, on this idea of the Chinese being able to get what they want. Um, and, and, com and countries needing to give that up either because of the primacy of China's economic institutions or because of military might or because of its international power and so forth. And so this further, I think, gives ammunition to this sort of aggressive diplomatic actions against other countries that we're gradually seeing more and more of. And, you know, the U.S. is something we talk about very, very often, but it extends so much beyond the United States. I mean, it's really much in terms of the One Belt, One Road in Africa and Southeast Asia, in terms of all these countries that Chinese, that China has interests in, and they're going to continue to pursue those interests quite aggressively, even if those interests may be contrary to what international organizations or to the law-based order in these countries and so forth. So that's, I think, the second part. The third part you mentioned was on businesses. Um, and and I, I think it's two components. I think what we talked about earlier in terms of espionage, that has a chilling effect on business. I'm not sure this is directly correlated mm -hmm. with the idea of the business environment, but certainly it feeds in into this overall environment that we see right now of a more aggressive, a more belligerent China that is going to very, you know, in terms of muscle and power, going to defend its international interests. You talk about how China used these laws to flex its muscles. Back to you, Wen Ti. Uh, one article of the Foreign Relations Act stipulates that China's law overrides the international treaties and they will have extraterritorial, extraterritorial law enforcement. What's your take on this? Well, A, it's their prerogative, but B, it's not going to come across very well to other countries, particularly those countries that may have ongoing territorial dispute with China, for example. We're talking about countries in Southeast Asia that may have uh, different takes on the validity of the Nine Dash Line, for example, on their dispute in South China Sea Islands. That's one area. But we're also talking about other countries that may have significant uh, business and other dealing with China as well. Because all this international trade, investment in other countries, this can all potentially fall under the umbrella of foreign relations. So when you claim that your domestic law is infinitely non-negotiably much more powerful and applicable than that of something we all agreed on, i.e. international law, in a way, uh, Domestically, it's going to play well. This fit into the narrative of the East is rising and the West is declining. This is going to bring in some nationalism brownie points for sure domestically. But internationally, I cannot see how that's going to make anyone else outside of China feel more comfortable and emboldened to pursue relations with China or make investment there with confidence and a sense of security. 
Indeed. So after five years of hiatus, finally the U.S. and China had a high-level meeting. Antony Blinken finally paid a visit. It seems that U.S.-China relations are finally getting better. But do you think that with the implementation of this law, this will further reinforce Xi's inclination towards the more assertive wolf warrior diplomacy? Well, um, I think certainly um, it's a good thing for the international community that the United States and China are talking. Um, I think the U.S. had made a number of overtures in the run-up to this meeting in terms of wanting to engage, uh, whether in Shangri-La, whether through other forms. And to a certain extent, the Chinese have not been very receptive, but at least the door for some sort of limited diplomatic engagement has been open. Now, certainly from a U.S. perspective, I'm sure they would hope that this leads to a much more uh, of a military uh, mechanism to ensure that accidents and misunderstandings don't take place um, that jeopardize um, regional peace and stability. Um, as to whether that is potentially jeopardized by this law, I, I'm not, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so, to be honest. Again, I think this law codifies and justifies what to a certain extent they're already doing, um, both in the United States and, and in many other countries around the world. Um, I think the U.S. has placed this idea of communication as a top priority simply because, again, they want to manage great power relations effectively. And they want to make sure that there's simply no potential for me not being able to talk to you and that en ends up leading towards some sort of conflict. And so I think that sort of justification and that sort of primacy um, and agency outweighs any potential fallback we could potentially see from this foreign relations law. So uh, Wen Ti, you just talked about the important structure and also the connotations the uh, foreign relations uh, law from China may have. So China actually used a law to justify that it is a countermeasure to the hegemony and also it's a way for them to strengthen their legal framework when it comes to how it handles external relations. Do you think that the law can really benefit China's national interest? So as with all things in policy, it's really down to implementation. I can see that if China's leadership one day decide that it's important to them to rein in wolf warrior diplomacy, then potentially this could be one legal foundation, one legal uh, instrument they could use to further rein them in if they so choose to do it. Uh, the point here is that uh, there are so many things this law covers, so many things that they're already doing anyway. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it, however, is that those who uh, disobey or behave differently from the true spirit of top leadership's orders. In the past, if they disobey such orders or don't honor it, don't honor it completely, then they will run afoul of party discipline. They may be subject to party censure, they may have their membership invoked, party membership that is. Going forward, however, uh, if they still uh, don't honor leadership's uh, orders, then what they're looking at is not just that kind of party di discipline, but legal uh, sanction up to and including imprisonment. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.